Officer Jim Chi was thinking that either his right front tire was a little low or there was something wrong with the shock on that side. On the other hand, maybe the road grader operator hadn't been watching the adjustment on his blade and he had tilted the road. Whatever the cause, Chi's patrol car was pulling just a little to the right. The radio speaker made an uncertain noise, then produced the voice of Officer Delbert Nez. Running on fumes, I'm going to have to buy some of that high-cost Red Rock gasoline or walk home. If you do, I advise paying for it out of your pocket, she said, better than explaining to the captain why you forgot to fill it up. I think, Nez said, and then the voice faded out. Your signal's breaking up, she said. I don't read you. Silence, static, silence. The steering seemed to be better now. Probably not a low tire, probably. And then the radio intruded again. Catch the son of a bitch with the smoking paint gun in his hand, Nez was saying. I'll bet then the Nez voice vanished, replaced by silence. I'm not reading you, she said into his mic. You're breaking up, which wasn't unusual. There were a dozen places on the 25,000 square miles in Navajo cause of big res, where radio transmission was blocked for a variety of reasons. Here between the monolithic volcanic towers of Shiprock, the Carrizo Range and the Chuska Mountains was just one of them. She presumed those radio blind spots were caused by the mountains, but there were other theories. Deputy Sheriff Cowboy Dashie insisted that it had something to do with the magnetism in the old volcanic necks that stuck up here and there, like great black cathedrals. Old Thomasina Big Thumb had told him once that she thought witches caused the problem. True, this part of the reservation was notorious for witches, but it was also true that old lady Big Thumb blamed witches for just about everything. And then Agatha Christie type stuff. Then all, the whole book depends on who done it and keeping who done it concealed and leaving a trail that if the reader had been very astute, the reader could have followed. In, in the stuff I write, the why it was done is much more important. What's going on here is important. In, in uh, Coyote Waits, the uh, who done it is arrested visibly by the hero in the second chapter. In this kind of fiction and in any fiction, you have to face the fact, I think, that your readers are going to be intelligent people. They're going to have important things on their mind. And uh, you're competing for this attention. Now, you've got to, early on and consistently, meet those expectations. They've got to, they've got to, the tension in the book's got to be maintained. They, they've got to care. Well, you, one way you do it is by making them care about the characters or rouse their interest in, 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 the, in the people. Maybe they don't care about them, but they're interested in them. Or arouse their interest in what's going on, what's going to happen next, suspense, dread. Hey, is something sinister going to happen here to this nice guy or nice gal? You know, and if you, if you lose that interest, then they put the book down, and I put down th hundreds and thousands of books unfinished and go do something that you really ought to be doing, you know, like polishing your shoes. Or well, the weather tonight has a little bit of moisture moving into our area. You can in Albuquerque, in the right studio of KO8 TV, Howard Morgan was explaining it. Had Jim Chi been at home in his trailer with his battery-powered television turned on, he would have been seeing Morgan standing in front of a projection of a satellite photograph, explaining how the jet stream had finally shifted south, pulling cool, wet air with it. There you have it, rains at last. Good news if you're growing rhubarb, bad news if you're planning picnic. But she was not at home watching the weather cat. He was more or less racing the storm front, driving through the cloud-induced early twilight with his lights on. He drove the final 2.3 miles that Alice Yazzie had indicated on her map with his windshield wipers lashing and the rain pounding on the roof. He parked a polite distance from the house and sat for a moment with his headlights on, waiting. The front door opened and the light outlined a shape, wearing the voluminous long skirt and long sleeve blouse of the traditional Navajo woman. She stared out into Chi's headlights, then made a traditional welcoming motion and disappeared into the house. He walked toward the house, 
past a parked truck. The damp air carried a thousand smells aroused by rain. But something was missing. Chi's intelligence had its various strengths and its weaknesses. A superb memory, a tendency to exclude new input while it focused too narrowly on a single thought, a tendency to be distracted by beauty, and so forth. One of the strengths was an ability to process new information and collate it with old unusually fast. In a millisecond, she identified the missing odor. No animals. The place was little used. Why use it now? Chi's brain identified an assortment of possible explanations. But all this changed him mid-stride from a man happily walking through the rain toward a long anticipated meeting to a slightly uneasy man with a memory of being shot at. It was just then that Chi noticed the oil. It stopped him. He looked at the oily spot, then back at the house. The door was open a few inches. He felt all those odd, intense sensation caused when intense fear triggers the adrenaline glands. Maybe nothing. Leaky oil pans are usual enough among old trucks, so common on the reservation. But he had been foolish, careless, and he turned back toward his pickup, walking at first, then breaking into a trot. His pistol was locked in the glove compartment. He was not conscious of any separation between the boom of the shotgun and the impact that staggered him. When I'm writing and I'm trying to develop a character, I want that character to seem to all my readers to be real. By George, that, I knew that guy. That's the way that neighbor of mine probably was if I'd really got to know him. A real, live, thinking, hurting, crazy, mixed up human being. That's the perfect character. What's most important in one of my novels now, I guess, is what's going on with the characters. And the plot more and more is becoming the background against which this development of characters works out. I wouldn't have said that 20 years ago. I mean, I wrote a mystery first because I didn't think I could handle characterization. Here you have an, an attempt to introduce a, an important new character. The place is the uh, coffee shop in Crown Point, New Mexico. You're not playing the game, Mary Landon said. I told you about me. You're just telling me about your family. The statement surprised Jim Chi. One defined oneself by their family. How else? And then it occurred to him that white people didn't. They identified themselves by what they had done as individuals. That's the way we play the game, he said. If I introduced you to Navajos, I would say, this woman is a member of and your mother's family and your father's family, and I'd tell about your uncles and aunts so everyone would know just exactly how, where you fit with the people around you. This woman, Mary Landon said, you wouldn't tell him my name? That would be rude, she said. Now more people have English names, but among the traditional Navajos, it's very impolite to say someone's name in their presence. Names are just reference words when the person's not there, she said. Mary Landon looked incredulous. I think that's, she stopped. Silly, she asked. You have to understand the system. Our real names are secret. Someone very close to you in the family names you when you're little, something that fits your personality if possible. Now, not more than a half a dozen people are ever going to know your real name. It's used for ceremonial purposes. Then as you grow, people give you nicknames to refer to you, like Crybaby or Hard Runner, or maybe Long Hands or Ugly. She laughed. I've got an uncle on my father's side who everybody calls Liar. How about Jim Chi? Isn't that your real name? She asked. And then you make the point by having him evade the question and not tell her his real name, which communicates not just something about the Navajo culture, but something about his slightly standoffish relationship with this one mother. He's not ready yet to tell her his real name, and maybe he never will be. Oddly enough, Lee Porn was, a, was an accident in my first book. I had no intention of 
uh, getting involved with a series of books about the Navajos. In the first draft of that book, Joe Leaphorn was a uh, really very minor character. When I got it back from the editor, she said uh, she didn't like the way it ended. Okay, so I've got to do some rewriting. And, and I took advantage of that opportunity to beef up the role of Leaphorn, who by then I'd become acquainted with, and you know, I saw him as an interesting character. So he, in the final draft of the book, he got a much more interesting role. Jim Chi was another uh, more or less accident. Ac accident partly brought on by the kind of book I wanted to write. I wanted to take Leaphorn into the checkerboard reservation, which where everything's all mixed up with, and uh, put Leaphorn in this setting and, and use this setting to highlight the the richness, I hoped, of the Navajo culture. Well, Lee Porn, the way I developed him in the first two books was, was uh, far too sophisticated uh, a fellow to be much impressed or amazed or by any of this. Didn't work well. So I had a, uh, shall we say, artistic reason for needing a new cop. Then uh, the second reason, I'd signed a very bad contract, a film movie contract, and uh, I'd lost the, uh, I lost the rights to Lee Porn, the character rights uh, f for movie or television, see? And uh, this, I resented this. I thought, why should I continue using this bird if I don't own him, only own two thirds of him, you know? I don't own his left leg. So I thought, I'll just see if I can come up with another character. For me, a Navajo protagonist gives me a chance to have a, an outsider look at American culture. And what does he see? He sees a culture driven by, basically, by greed. Greed for fame, greed for material possessions, greed for, really greed for, for, for nonsense, for stuff that doesn't really matter. And uh, I picked on the Navajos, well, basically because A, I like them, and B, I like their culture, and C, I like their religion, and D, I like their reservation. Now back it up. Why do I like the reservation? Because it's immense, it's uh, full of beautiful places, and, and uh, I always liked empty places. Okay, the Navajos because they're very much like the people I grew up with. They're country people. They, they live a long ways from town, as I did. They have a tremendous sense of humor. They're, they're very friendly and very hospitable. Uh, I like their culture because it is family-oriented, people-oriented. If you look at the Navajo religion, it has such beauty in it. It's, it's, it's based on... Uh, Primarily, it's, it's, we, we have to oversimplify it in this short time, but it's based on trying to keep the human being in harmony with circumstances, with the environment, with the ecology, with the nature, with his neighbors, with, with the weather, with what's surrounding him, with what's coming down, with the bad luck he just had. So he is content, so he is happy, so he's in harmony. Uh, so Ho's role is maintained, the beauty of life. Uh, there's something notable about that. But I'm not an anthropologist. I'm a, I'm a writer of mystery novels, fiction. You can read everything I've ever written and, and, and not say you know much about Navajos, but you know a little bit. I'm not sure. Um, it's a damn. I'm not sure. Oh no. I'm often asked a question that goes something like this: Wasn't it hard for you, who spent 17 years as a journalist, to become a fiction writer? As a matter of fact, uh, nearly anyone who writes, who tries to write at any sophisticated level. Has, is confronted with the fact that unless they are, have gone to Yale and have relatives in the publishing business, they are going to have to write several million words before they're going to be taken seriously, before they're good enough, before they've mastered the language enough to be published. See, 
So how do you, if you're a poor boy, and you don't have a rich uncles or parents and stuff, how do you make a living while you're turning out these millions of words? And one way you do it is you, you, you get paid for writing them in an ad agency, in a newspaper office, so forth. I'm not so sure television helps, frankly, because you see what is written on television, and you think, my God, they don't give people IQ tests. Being a reporter teaches you how to write. That's, it. That's the most important. Teach you how to make, how to form a sentence in a paragraph and get it said without floundering around. Then it teaches you how to find information. You know, that's your profession, retrieving information. Third, and maybe this is as, as important as one, it puts you in a day-to-day -day contact with people under stress. You're in death row in the state penitentiary talking to a guy who, in, in about four and a half, maybe five hours, is going to go to the gas chamber. And is very conscious of his watch. You know what I mean? Uh, you, can, you can live a long life as an English professor and be a superb writer, but you don't have these experiences. Okay, here we run into a the, my best example I can think of, of, of how when, when you can give your imagination a little bit of rest when you have to create an important character. If you have some experience with this, with a character from real life who will fit. And in this case, when I'd been a newspaper reporter, I had gone to the prison to interview a fellow who was about to go to the gas chamber. And he wanted to be interviewed because he was engaged in a had been engaged in a lifelong search for his mother. And he told me a story. Uh, and I changed it a lot, but, but here we'll pick up my bad guy. Colton had stood beside his pickup, looking back at the house. Sparse grass, he remembered, was no longer there. The glass in one window was replaced by plywood. Otherwise, it looked much the same. The last time he had seen it was a day after his 12th birthday, the last time he had come home. The boy he knew at school had said he couldn't stay at his house any longer, and he had walked home to see if Buddy Shaw had sobered up, and if Buddy Shaw would let him return. He had found the house empty. He had peered through the windows and seen the kitchen stripped of his mother's pans and the bathroom stripped of her toiletries. But in the room where he slept, his things were still scattered. The bed clothing was gone from the cot, but the blue jacket his mother had got for him somewhere was still hanging on his peg, and his books were there, and his cap. He had broken a window and gone inside, cutting his hand in his panic. And it seemed to me that would, that sort of abandonment, which produced the crimes that was taking this young man to the gas chamber, would also motivate, uh, make the reader believe in the motivation of a man to become a professional killer. I think most writers tend to think that everybody has the same sort of psychology they have. You know, the same thing intrigued the reader out there, intrigued the writer. Uh, I, I love things that do not have the, the I dotted and the T crossed. I love things that you don't quite understand, that you're still puzzled over. What happened to the, what happened to the Anasazi? Why did they leave behind so much stuff? when they left chocolate. Uh, there was a story in the Albuquerque Journal this morning of, in which a Navajo policeman was found hanged on a, by a towel tied to a partition in a motel. The police ruled it was an accidental death. The, I mean, the medical examiner ruled it was an accidental death. Okay, obviously it was not. If, if the newspaper report is accurate, why did they rule that? Those things, I love those things. What caused a medical examiner to say, this young man went into a motel room, tied a towel to a partition, tied it around his neck, kicked the chair out from under his feet, hanged himself, or hanged. Why did they not say it was suicide? I've been asked 
what is the perfect mystery? When I was first asked it, I thought for some reason about an interview I saw on BBC once of a, in which a young woman was interviewing a astrophysicist about the Big Bang theory, which started the cosmos. And he described it in rather lucidly in some detail. And at the conclusion of his explanation, this BBC reporter said, I can't remember his name, but she said, but what was there before the Big Bang? And he said, he frowned and he said, young lady, that is a non-question. But to me, the big question I ask is the same one the young woman asked. And I think that is the ultimate supreme mystery. And that's why I think the, reason, the, the fact that I feel that way is the same element in my nature that causes me to be attracted to Navajos and Hopis and other religious people who, whose intellect will not allow them to stop at, the, at physics and their intellectual curiosity forces them off into the non-question beyond physics into metaphysics. Uh, there is the ultimate mystery. Who am I? What are we doing here? What is our purpose? What's valuable? How did he get here? That's the question, Kennedy said. He wasn't thrown off the Amtrak, that's obvious. He doesn't look like the type to be riding a freight. So I guess that probably means someone carried him here. But why the hell would anybody do that? You think you can find any tracks for us? Leaphorn tried. He walked down the railroad embankment some 20 paces and started to circle through the sage, snakeweed and chamisa. An early autumn shower had moved over this area about a week ago, making tracking easy. Leaphorn circled back the embankment without finding anything except the marks left by rodents, lizards, snakes. He walked another dozen yards down the track and started another circle, wider now. Then he crisscrossed the sagebrush around the body, slowly, eyes down. Leaphorn made a wry face. He shook his head. Nothing, he said. If someone carried him in from this side, they carried him up from way, way down the tracks. What were you looking for, Kennedy asked, besides tracks? Nothing in particular, Leaphorn said. You're not really looking for anything in particular. If you do that, you don't see things you're not looking for. So you think he got brought in from way down the tracks, Kennedy said. I don't know, Leaphorn said. Why would anyone do that? That's a lot of hard work and a risk of being seen while you're doing it. Why is this sagebrush better than any other sagebrush? Maybe they hauled him in from the other side, Kennedy said. Leaphorn stared across the tracks. There was no road over there either. How about lifting him off a train? Amtrak is going about 65 miles an hour here, Kennedy said. Doesn't start slowing down for gallop for miles. I can't see that man on a freight, and they don't stop out here either. I checked with the railroad on that. They stood then on the embankment above the man with the pointed shoes, with nothing to say in the presence of death. The ambulance crew came down the track carrying a stretcher, trailed by a pathologist carrying a satchel. He squatted beside the body, tested the skin of the neck, tested the stiffness of the wrist, bent finger joints, looked into the toothless mouth. He looked up at Kennedy. How'd he get here? Kennedy shrugged. Characters you, you really know tend to develop personalities and they tend to become very real in your imagination. If you want them to do something that's, if, if the plot requires them to do something that that, that kind of person wouldn't do, then you, then you find you have real trouble with it. I've had that happen to me in a good many books. Dance All the Dead, the, uh, you meet the killer early on in the book. And, that, but, and I met him too. And, and uh, as I got acquainted with him, he became the wrong kind of guy to commit to murder. So I had to change it. For some reason, I find it much more, much easier to write if I know the locale. 
if I know when the cop's looking out of the window, he's seeing an escarpment, and the escarpment is sandstone, and when the sun's going down, it's turning pink. See? Uh, I, I need to know, know that for some reason, and, and at least I don't have to know it, but it's much more comfortable for me to write when I do know it. And writing being a miserably difficult business, anything I can do to be more comfortable, I do. This Colores program is available on home video cassette for $19.95, plus shipping and handling. To order, call 1-800-328-5663.